it's so bad. Some people win, some people lose. The game is over. Amelia? They are nightmare-inducing scenes, taken from the pages of books that tempt us to stay up well past our bedtime to find out what will happen next. And then leave us lying awake, wondering if someone's in our closet or basement. What kind of person could come up with this heart-stopping content? I'm as close as a shadow. How about a man who not only wrote this song, but sings folk music, enjoys cooking so much he makes tutorial videos. So we uh, cook down the uh, butter and oil until it gets nice and uh, toasty warm. And has such a deep love for dogs, he shows them at big events like the Westminster Dog Show. Not exactly what you had in mind. Don't worry, he's heard that before. I did a, a book event a few years ago. And um, a woman came up to me afterwards and says, Mr. Deaver, I'm, I'm actually kind of disappointed. And I said, I'm sorry, was it something about the book? She said, no, you were funny. You, you seem nice. I, I wanted you to be more like a ghoul. It's just another one of Jeffrey Deaver's surprises. After all, he's known for them in his more than 40 best-selling suspense novels, including his newest Coulter Shaw book, The Goodbye Man. And then it's got a surprise ending and then following that, there's a surprise ending. And after that, there's a, oh, let me think, a surprise ending, because I love my surprise endings. We talk with the University of Missouri Journalism School grad turned lawyer, turned renowned thriller writer about the misperceived rendezvous that inspired his latest title. And I knew then, someday I'm gonna write about that, but I have a lot of ideas. And it just took about 40 years to put that on the uh, front burner how he chooses where to take his characters and readers in these pages. There are a lot of places I, I love, love to go. I don't necessarily want to create carnage and death and devastation there. And the detailed outlines he makes to turn his ideas into highly acclaimed page turners. We want a book that will uh, give us a happy, happy time like on a roller coaster. We get on a roller coaster knowing we're going to be scared, but also knowing that at the end, we're going to get off and then go eat a hot dog and have cotton candy. That's what I want my, my books to be. Jeffrey Deaver, thank you so much for joining us. I'm delighted to be with you, Angie. You've had, what, more than 40 novels now that you've written. This has to be one of the strangest book releases you've ever had. I've been a full-time writer now for uh, 30 years, over 30 years now, uh, written for 35 years. So I've been touring for a long, long time, and I've had some very bizarre instances, incidents on some of those tours. But this is the strangest, no doubt about it. Anything <laughs> remarkable that you'd want to share? No, no. So we have three hours for this interview, correct? <laughs> right. <laughs> 35 uh, years worth, right? Uh, the, the funniest story about touring, I'll have to tell you, though, was uh, I was in um, Maryland with another author. We were on tour, and a fellow came into the store to hear our event. Now, we were very new to the business, and there were very, very few people in the audience. I think only three or four people. And um, they didn't know who we were. We didn't sell any books. And the fellow that I'm, I'm thinking of came up to us afterwards and said, wow, I, I read about your, your book event here. Um, and we said, well, great, do you want to buy a book? Because no one else had. He said, no, no, I'm not interested in that. But it said you were staying in downtown Baltimore. I wonder if I get a ride back with you. And <laughs> you know, we gave him a ride back because who knew who it might have been? It might have been a movie producer uh, just testing us out or down on his luck. But we weren't <laughs> murdered by anybody. But uh, Angie, I could go on and on. Uh, touring is absolutely wonderful. And uh, as much as I enjoy this virtual tour, I can't wait till we get back to normal. I love meeting fans, love hearing uh, what they like about my books and what they don't like about my books. Yeah. Too. Well, for people who haven't had the chance to read it yet, could you give us a little description of The Goodbye Man? Sure. The Goodbye Man features my new series character, Coulter Shaw, who premiered last year in The Never Game, a book about murder in Silicon Valley. Now, Coulter Shaw has an unusual career. He travels around the country in his Winnebago, and he looks for rewards that have been posted by either the government, maybe for an escaped convict, or for a terrorist that the uh, 
the feds haven't been able to find, or for, a, um, say, a missing uh, student, uh, parents offer reward privately, but Colter Shaw um, learns about the rewards and travels around the country to find them. Now, the Never Game ended with Colter Shaw being presented with two choices of where to go next, uh, springboards, if you will, into two different plots. One was to pursue some uh, neo-Nazis who had defaced a church and shot someone, apparent hate crime in Washington state, or he could return to his family settlement in the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains of California and follow uh, a lead as to who might have murdered his father. And he was torn between the, the two. And I, as an author, was torn between the two. So I launched The Goodbye Man, uh, which occurs right after The Never Game. It picks up only about, um, I guess, 13 hours after The Never Game ends and takes him to uh, Washington State. He pursues the, uh, the evildoers there who, if you know, you know anything about, about my books, they may not be quite as evil as we thought, but maybe they are. Twists and turns. And then we launch into yet another story that does take us closer to his, um, to his father. It's, it's like all my books. It's a roller coaster ride. It takes place over... Uh, about three days. It has lots of internal reversals. It has a lot of esoterica about a subject that I didn't know anything about, but I learned uh, a great deal of in the uh, researching the book about cults. This was actually based on the idea, I guess, I read that you were actually approached by someone who was interested in, in having you join a cult. Is that right? Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, a woman, uh, when I was uh, practicing law in New York, um, met a woman through the law firm and uh, she was single, attractive, quite interesting. And I was single. I can't verify the attractive part, but I was definitely, <laughs> definitely single. And uh, we kind of hit it off the office and she invited me to uh, uh, what I thought was a date. And it turned out to be a recruitment for a, uh, a cult in a, a large ballroom in a hotel in Manhattan. And it was a scary, scary thing. I, I didn't feel physically uh, threatened, I, I think. I'm not sure. I felt psychologically pressured. I felt the, uh, the tension that one feels being in a crowd where the crowd is kind of controlled by a mob mentality. I, I'm not a joiner. I don't play well with others. There was no doubt I was not tempted. But, uh, but to sit in the audience and see this frenzy around me and then see this fellow up on stage who was a, a, you know, a charismatic uh, a guy, a slick, uh, probably in his 40s, good looking. But to see them sell their souls to this man uh, really made me feel um, uneasy. But also not only for myself, but uneasy for them because these were professional people. She, she was recruiting other people, other professionals as well. And people who you think would have um, you know, a good, good sensibility, be well balanced, uh, you know, presumably have some resources but you'd be surprised at how uh, easily they were snagged and pulled into the, uh, the organization. And, and I knew then someday I'm gonna write about that, but I have a lot of ideas and it just took about 40 years to put that on the uh, front burner. That's amazing, so I just sat back there just kind of waiting for the right opportunity. I'm very lucky. I am a, a pedestrian writer. My prose is functional. And I'm not a great stylist like the great uh, writer Annie Prue or Cormac McCarthy or David Foster Wallace. I, I tell kind of meat and potato stories, but I, I'm very lucky. I've been given a, a good imagination and the ideas have never been a problem. I have lots and lots of ideas for stories. The idea file will long outlast me. So I kind of have to pick and choose the ones that I think will be the most uh, productive and efficient to write. And that's one that just sat there. And then I thought, well, probably time to, uh, to, to write it. I, I will say, uh, my outlines are very extensive. The outline for the, uh, the Goodbye Man, for instance, was about 140 pages long. I do a great deal of research ahead of time. I do a great deal of outlining. I, I don't write the book itself uh, for probably eight months. I do the outline and then research for eight months. So I must have read 30 books on cults. That outlining process is something that, that I read somewhere that it took you a couple of years to kind of figure out how important that was, right? You, you, what do you call it? The mint toothpaste business plan? The, the mint toothpaste business plan. I'll tell, tell you the, about that very quickly. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it quite brief. Say I was a product designer at Procter & Gamble and I go to my boss and I say, I've got a great product idea. My girlfriend and I had some pate last night, pate's, you know, liver. 
um, why don't we come up with a toothpaste that's liver flavored? And nobody's ever done it before. And it'll make us very um, popular and uh, get us a lot of press. And my boss says, sure, it'll get us a lot of press and it'll get you fired, which you are right now, because nobody wants liver flavored toothpaste, right. mint flavored toothpaste. Well, I want to write books that are mint flavored books. What does that mean? It doesn't matter how I enjoy the time I'm writing. It's about the reader getting a good product that will satisfy them, make them smile, give them an exciting page turning book with no digression, no far fetched plots, no excessive gruesome, no children or animals who are injured in, in the story. Uh, one of my rules about writing is that you have to, as an author, raise questions in your reader's minds. I was going to say every chapter, frankly, I think every few pages. And you raise questions at the end of the book. And these are important questions. Readers want to know the answer. But you have to answer the questions. You have to resolve every single conflict. Otherwise, you're, you're left with uh, dissatisfied readers. And that's a sin. You cannot do that. And only through outlining am I able to do that. Now, many authors can sit down with a blank screen or blank page of paper and craft a wonderful book. Many wonderful crime writers do that. I'm not able to do that. I write a very tightly paced book. I have three plots going on at once. Uh, some of my ideas probably won't work. And if I start out with an outline, I learn within a week or so or 10 days that it's not going to be a book and I throw it out. If I start writing and have 100, 200, 300 pages of, of decent prose and then realize it's not going to go anywhere, look at all the time I've wasted. So an outline helps me produce mint flavored books. Wow, and you, you actually have the outline there that you did for oh, yeah, yeah. The Goodbye Man. So <laughs> we'll do a little, uh, in my era, it was called Show and Tell in Grace. Yeah. I don't know what it's called now. This is the first page of the outline. Uh, it won't do you any good. You probably can't read any of this, but these are the first few pages are just notes. Um, an idea occurs to me. Let's see. Uh, here's one. There's a book of rights that... Um, Master Eli carries around with him that sits on his desk. It turns out that it's not really rights. It's a book of Joseph Goebbels, Nazis propagandist. He reads all the time to um, uh, learn how to um, kind of seduce the minds of the cult members. I can mention that because it didn't, I took it out of the book, but it was an idea I thought I might have. And these are just little notes to myself. This is what happens in section one. A boulder crashes down the, uh, highway. Um, all right, so here I'm just going to give you one other little thing here. Now we see why this is, this is blank. Uh, this is four, section four. We're back to the present. I explain what happens here. And um, he, uh, let's see, he meets the bad guy on the road, and I'm um, writing about his backstory. So I refer to my research, page 390 of my research. When I write this book, I then put this outline in front of me. I have a big stack of research books. And so I, when I come to, to write this, I flip through the uh, research material, turn to page 390. And I know that's the material I have to put in here. And uh, here's one I need to know about cars. That says Google. I didn't bother to, to research it and write it down. I'll simply type in whatever kind of car I'm talking about. So anyway, that's the outline. And I work on that over and over and over again. And then by the end of uh, the... Uh, roughly six months. Uh, it comes more quickly now. It used to uh, take me about eight months. Now I can do it in about six months. And my books are shorter now as well. Then that's done. And I sit down and write. And I often get the question, does the outline change? And yes, it, it does some, but it's about 90% there. I found that in my books, I tend to kill too many people. <laughs> it's a drag not only for them, but for me, because when you have a death, as I tell my students, uh, you know, a death is a very, very big thing. We cannot treat it cavalierly. And I see in so many, um, particularly on television, so many uh, adventure shows, people are machine gunned down. Nobody blinks about it. There's no remorse. There are no consequences. And uh, that's not the way it should be. It has to have an emotional impact. And that requires a lot more writing. And so I, uh, I tend to take out the extra victims. Uh, less is more. I know you've talked about how, you know, write about a place that you know well. And I know sometimes you go to that place and, and kind of reacquaint yourself with those surroundings. Did, did you go to the wilderness of Washington State for the Goodbye Man? Um, well, I had, I had been there, yes. I've been to um, every place I write about, I've been. 
I'll tell you a fast, funny story, though. Uh, I wrote a book a few years ago called A Maiden's Grave, and I set this exciting scene where two girls have been kidnapped, uh, managed to get away on a, a, a life raft, or I guess an inner tube, and cascade down this, uh, this dangerous, de dangerous death-defying rapids, and they end up safe, and they're rescued, a, a big set piece where they're pulled out of the water, and come, some people almost drown, but they're safe. And I set that in a real creek or river that I had, had been at. And then I started to get the emails because uh, yes, I had been there. I had been there 20 years before. That is 20 years before it was dammed up. And the worst part, I should say it this way, the, the most danger presented by that creek now was that you would trip over a cow pie and sprain your ankle and wrist. And if I'm not going to describe what a cow pie is, but if anybody out there is really curious, you can look it up. Yeah. But had I been there? Yes. Had I uh, updated my knowledge of it? No. So I go to everywhere. I've been to the wilderness of uh, uh, Washington State, although not as wildernessy as Colt Shaw is. I've been to uh, Gig Harbor, um, uh, the Sierra Nevadas. I've been to all of those, all of those places. Now, the Snoqualmie Gap, where this cult is, it, it, that's a fictitious place, though, right? That's fictitious, yeah. I, I don't want people to feel bad. I had, in this book, I have corrupt police people. I have some very good police people, but just like in real life, there are good people and there are corrupt people and good police people and bad police people. And I didn't want to associate anyone with a, um, a, a, a real uh, police organization. So uh, no one will be upset. Nothing I can do about the NYPD. And sorry, but uh, that's just the way it is. So uh, now uh, my new books, the two books I'm working on right now, Colter Shaw's new book, where he uh, returns to a, a particular town, almost gave it away. Uh-oh, have to be clever, more clever about that. Returns to a particular town. Uh, I, I've been there uh, many times. So that's going to be, uh, that's good to go. And Lincoln Rhyme, of course, is set in New York City. So that's going to be good as well. But since you have ties to Missouri, do you think you'll set any, any upcoming books in Missouri? Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. I will. I, um, will um, um, I, how do I put it this way? There are a lot of places I, I love, love to go. I don't necessarily want to create carnage and death and devastation there. So I'll have to, I'll have to be very careful and, and figure out something. Well, you know, I have to say as a um, big reader of Mark Twain, the, the Mississippi is, is just calling out to have something written about it. Uh, so I could very easily see myself doing that, whether it's barges, whether it's uh, traffic. Uh, I was just down in uh, New Orleans, took my, uh, my nieces down there and uh, kind of, you know, reignited the excitement for the river boats. We, we went out on one and uh, all you do is turn around and go, you know, a thousand miles north and there you are. One of the things I also wanted to talk to you about was Lincoln Rhyme and, and The Bone Collector. And he's been in now, what, 15 books? Is that? Probably 14 or 15, yeah. Okay. And now, is it true? I, I saw somewhere that you thought about killing him off in that first book, The Bone Collector? Yes. Uh, if you're not familiar with Lincoln, uh, you are obviously, Angie, but if uh, viewers aren't, list, uh, aren't familiar, um, he's a quadriplegic. Was, uh, that was paralyzed from the neck down. He was head of the New York City uh, crime scene unit many years ago and was injured on the job and was paralyzed. Uh, so the bone collector opens with him having been paralyzed for several years and facing the existential decision that anybody with a, 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 a catastrophic illness or disease or life-ending condition faces does he or she want to preempt the end and maybe speed it along? And I thought it was worth looking at because I like my books to be crime roller coasters, but I also like to, you know, consider issues in more depth. I think it gives the book more resonance and touches the reader's heart more. And assisted suicide was one of those topics in, in the book. And so through the end of the book, he's debating, uh, should I kill myself? And, um, He's, he is an improbable hero. He's a Sherlock Holmes in a way, but Sherlock Holmes, you know, got out into the wilderness. He carried a gun occasionally. He used right. his fisticuffs against the bad guy. And uh, Lincoln Ryan was not able to do that. And so I debated, 
this book probably is a one-off. I enjoyed writing it. And then, um, uh, then I, I thought, you know what? I kind of like him. And then I came up with a great twist at the end, a great yes. twist that would permit the series to continue. And it's a good thing I did. And the answer to the question of why was it a good thing that you did, Jeff, I can answer four words. Denzel Washington, Angelina Jolie. Because as soon as the book came out, uh, Universal Pictures picked it up and made uh, a movie that I thought was a, was a good film. I had no involvement in it, no interest in being involved in it. But it's, it, it has become a um, really a cult classic. And he, he is just universally universally popular now around the world. Well, it, here we are 20 years later and NBC has yeah. Think and Rhyme, right? Yeah, yeah. It's very much like CSI or NCIS. Well, I don't know quite what's going to happen. It did well, but if they were going to pick up a second season, they were going to do that this month. And now all production is shut down. So right. we'll see what happens. So you have Coulter Shaw, you have Lincoln Rhyme, and then you also have Catherine Dance, all mm -hmm. these series. And you said that you're writing both a, a Lincoln Rhyme and a Coulter Shaw book right now? Yes. So when you go about doing that, do you, what do you have to do to get yourself in the right headspace for each of those different series? Yeah, I, um, I don't really have a lot, of, a lot of trouble doing it. The voice is pretty much the same. Lincoln's voice and Coulter's voice are, are very similar. You know, they're rugged heroes, rugged male heroes uh, with a sensitive side to them. Um, and um, intellectual, they're very thoughtful, but it takes me about a day to get into the book. I, I, let me say this, I will not write, out, write on both of them at the same time in the same day, jumping from day to day. I'll spend a week on one, put it aside, and spend a week on the other. And so I, after you have your outline for each of them, I, I, I saw somewhere that, that sometimes you all write in a dark room, even sometimes with the lights off. Is yeah. that? Yeah. So I have to wonder, I mean, there have been times where I've been reading your book and finish it and I have to get up and go check my doors <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, check the closet and see if anybody just happens to be there. Do you ever freak yourself out in the dark? I'm, I'm so happy I've, I've terrified you, Angie. That, that just does my heart good to hear that. Oh, gosh. Well, good. <laughs> I, uh, I, no, I, uh, I don't, well, I'm nervous like like everybody else about various things you know we're in a climate now where we have to be very careful i'm concerned about things i'm not a big fan of uh, heights i'm not a big fan of dangerous snakes i have copperheads near where i live and those i keep an eye out for those but those are just normal things i'm not afraid of uh, things that go bump in the night uh, my job is to scare other people so i think about what would scare the average prudent person and can pretty much come up with things like that. But as I mentioned earlier, not things that will gross them out. I don't want my books to make you feel uh, sick to your stomach or to be disgusting. So I try to make sure the readers have a fun, exciting time and uh, keep them, you know, keep them smiling at the end, uh, you know, breathing deeply, but smiling at the end. I, I saw somewhere that someone is asking you about retiring. Or someone was writing about that. That is, that's something that we, your readers, need to worry about. No, never. Great. Uh, and I'll, I'll go on record. I will never kill off a main character. Uh, what's the point? People don't in, don't enjoy that. Um, I will give them good friends that readers come to enjoy, and then maybe throw that person off a cliff because there has to be peril in the books. If everything happens uh, for good, if there's no risk that we're going to lose somebody we've formed an attachment to, then people are going to stop turning pages. So I may do that, but I'll never kill off the main character and I'll never, uh, never retire. So I'll keep writing for as long as I, uh, as long as I can. <laughs>